Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Thank you for the award, and thank you all for coming to uh, listen to me. Uh, yeah, I, I actually spent quite a few years uh, studying. I actually spent 17 years cumulatively studying in university, and our kids always say that that's a sign that I'm such a moron that it took me so many years to graduate. Um, the work that I'm going to present to you today is, is really, you know, is a tribute to the amazing fellows that I've been fortunate to work with and to an amazing set of experimental and computational collaborators uh, uh, that, uh, that we have. Um, and I, I will talk in, in general terms and, and feel free to ask me anything and because uh, that, that's my goal. So um, the title is uh, What Can We Learn from the Good Old Pathology Slides in This Area, in This uh, Time of, of you know, All These Buzzwords with AI and Deep Learning and How Does It Gonna Affect uh, Precision Oncology? And I'll start from the end and I'll tell you that it's quite exciting times. In, in many levels, and, and I want to share that with you. Um, right, so I am a technologically challenged guy. Okay, I don't know. Uh, well, I'll try to, uh, yeah. So I, I will present two approaches to go to, you know, the 100 years or more histopathology, hematoxyl and housing slides, and actually show you that we can use them today with AI to stratify patients to therapy and also to classify tumors to their subtypes. But before that, I want to start with um, a brief introduction to precision oncology. So precision oncology, you know, is a, is a interesting development, hopefully revolutionary development in our ability to treat cancer that goes beyond chemotherapies to new types of drugs. And you may have heard of targeted therapy drugs and immunotherapy. The issue that these, these are indeed very important contributions, but uh, each has their challenges, okay? And the issue is that targeted therapies are based on panels, sequencing panels that identify actionable mutations or fusion events that are targeted by therapy, but they currently offer uh, treatment opportunities to only about 10% or 15% of cancer patients which have these driver mutations that are actionable, meaning that they are targeted by existing targeted therapies that are already in our arsenal. The issue with immunotherapy is, which is a tremendous revolution, is again that it is really helpful for various reasons only in some cancer indications and even in them still we do not have good biomarkers to predict which patients will respond and which won't. And that's a serious issue because all these treatments still have considerable side effects and many times we have a few alternatives as clinicians to treat our patients and we would like to know which is the best. Okay, so these are the challenges that my lab has been uh, addressing, you know, in, 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 in the last decade and more. And of course, many other fantastic computational labs in the computational cancer domain are addressing them. So, but I, what I want to share with you today is, is our ability, you know, to close a circle and use the good old pathology slides actually without any sequencing to uh, try to understand which are the best treatments that fit patients. Now, before I do that, I need to take you via a small foray into my lab's uh, um, 12 years effort by now 
to develop approaches that go beyond the DNA sequencing to harness RNA sequencing, the tumor gene expression, to identify uh, a treatment opportunities. And, and that depends on the concept of synthetic lethality. So let me explain. So two genes, A and B, are considered a synthetic lethal pair in cancer, and it's also a fundamental concept that you may know in genetics, if the knockout of each of the genes, A or B alone, the inactivation, doesn't reduce cell fitness, in our case, tumor cell fitness, but the concomitant knockout of both reduces cell fitness, okay? If we find such pairs, we call them synthetic lethal or synthetic sick. Why is that very important in cancer treatment? And this is already known for 25 years. Because, as you may know, most cancer drugs, 95% of them, inhibit their target. So suppose you have a drug that inhibits gene A, and suppose it has 10 different genes which are synthetic lethal in it. And I want to predict wherever a patient will respond to the drug. Now, I do DNA sequencing, RNA sequencing, methylation, copy number, what have you, from the patient's tumor, and I can look at the state of the 10 genes that are synthetic lethal with the target of the drug. If I find a patient where most of the genes are inactivated, their transcription is downregulated, their copy number is lost, uh, uh, the, the genes are mutated, I can safely predict that this patient is likely to respond to therapy because the synthetic lethal pairs of the drug target are inactivated. Is it clear, guys? You're with me? But if I have a patient where it is not so, then he is not likely to respond, okay? So the holy grail, the $100 billion question for 25 years, is to identify the synthetic lethal partners of genes in cancer, and in particularly of the targets of cancer drugs. Okay? Now, there's 20,000 genes. The combinatorial space is tremendous, right? And the in vitro assays are not so great and so on, and, and most of what you identify in vitro doesn't work in patients. You know that, I don't need to tell you. So the challenges are huge, and my lab is working already for 12 years, 13 years. Our first paper on this topic appeared in Cell in 2014, so a decade already ago, on this problem trying to identify clinically relevant synthetic lethal pairs of cancer drugs so that we can use them to stratify patients to targeted and immunotherapies. This is an ongoing challenge and battle, okay? And we, we still have work to do, but... So, there is a pipeline, I don't have the time to, to go into it, but you can ask me later, but what we do is, in a nutshell, we start from an initial candidates from in vitro screens, and then we mine tens of thousands of cancer tumor samples from patients to understand which are the more likely clinical relevant synthetic lethal pairs in cancer, and specifically of the drug targets. The intuition, just to give you in, in one sentence, is to identify pairs of genes A and B which we never almost see inactivated together in cancer. That is, if you think about it, a sign that they are selected against that testifies that they may be synthetic lethal. The issue is that there is a tremendous array of confounding factors that you need to carefully, statistically, computationally try to correct for in order to, and we are getting better and better in doing that, but we are, you know, there's still, there's still a lot to do. So we develop these pipelines and almost every year since 2014 we have been developing, you know, better versions in, in this ongoing effort to identify this tremendously important 
synthetic lethal uh, pairs. And it gives you, if you think about it, not only ways to stratify patients to tumors, but also ways to identify new treatments. And indeed, um, I don't know if you can see my mouse, or can I point somewhere? Or, I don't know. Oh my god. Yeah, so you, you can see that, that some of these new treatments that we identified with collaborators, of course, are in clinical trials. And I'll come immediately, very soon, to describe another exciting clinical trial that, that we are trying. And we, we are all the time honing these methods. And here, just to give you an idea, of how good we are. So this is a recent paper from MED where we took more than 20 or more independent clinical trial data sets, which we never train on, so there is no overfitting. Based on these principles of the synthetic little partners of the targets of the drugs, we ask how well can we stratify the patients to therapy, and the clinically relevant measure for that is something which is called the odds ratio, okay? If you say, if the algorithm says that the patient is likely to respond, what is the odds that he is likely to respond compared to when the algorithm says that he, it is not? And anything beyond two, two and a half, is considered clinically useful. And, and you can see that in many data sets, we get very accurate ability to predict, to identify who will the patient will respond in an array of different indications, and both in targeted and immunotherapies. But all this, I should cautionally note, is retrospective analysis. So these are independent data set. We didn't train on them, but it is retrospectively. So we need to do and show the ability of the method in a prospective clinical trial. Okay, and, and just to briefly mention, uh, uh, um, uh, this is another publication. As I told you, if you use conventional methods, you only cover about 15% of the patients. We estimate con conservatively that if our methods will be used in the clinic, we will be able to help 50, 50% of the patients. But of course, we, we need to show that, right? So we are now starting a clinical trial, and I'm very fortunate to be at the National Cancer Institute because this is a unique clinical trial, triple negative aggressive breast cancer, which is, is going to start uh, in, in Q3. And in this trial, we will treat uh, uh, breast cancer patients with an array of 16 different targeted and immunotherapy state-of-the-art treatments, and the choice and the matching of the treatment will be made by NCI clinicians based on the algorithm of the recommendations of our algorithm and so on. So, if it will succeed, you may hear about my name. If it won't, I probably get fired. Right? But we will learn from this, of course, and, and this is a unique trial because no pharma would ever fund such a trial because a typical trial by pharma is to with a drug target that they want to support and develop and so on. And here we are agnostically going to treat with 16 different treatments. Okay, so you are wondering what the hell is going on? I promised you to talk about slides and biomarkers from slides, and I'm actually talking about our efforts in transcriptomics. The reason is that two years ago we realized that, you know, there is a surge of papers now in deep learning and, and, and so on, looking at uh, radiological and pathological images and predicting various phenotypes, and really amazing work is being done. But we said to ourselves, hey, we have spent 10 years developing uh, uh, approaches for precision oncology from the measured tumor gene expression. So why won't we try to predict the tumor gene expression from the slides and then apply 
all the approaches that we have been worked on for 10 years from the measure transcriptomic, but instead to the inferred transcriptomics. You're with me, guys? So again, the one million dollar question is, can we, what's this crazy idea? Can we predict tumor gene expression from the histopathological slides? And the answer in, in three words is, yes, we can. And let me show you. So this is a paper to appear actually in, in the next few weeks in, in Nature Cancer. Was not trivial to convince the reviewers that we can do it. So it's a very uh, swiftly a, a deep learning architecture and, and so on and so on. And you can ask me. And th this uh, uh, figure shows you actually uh, the, the accuracy of the top 10,000 genes, the correlation between the actual measured expression and the inferred expression of the top best predicted 1,000 genes in different cancer types with different existing methods and with our architecture. Okay? And you can see that we can meaningfully predict a subset, of course, not all, but a subset, 2,000, 3,000 genes whose expression is highly predicted directly from the slides. So this is truly exciting for us because we have the methods to measure, to predict the response of patients from the measured. Let's see if we can indeed stratify patients of therapy based on the inferred expression directly from the slides. So that's what we did, and, and this slide is really the key slide of the talk. So here is the odds ratio, different indications, different types of therapy. We do not have, for most of them, the tumor transcriptomics. We just have the histopathological uh, slides. We have the response of the patients. We never train on these clinical trial data. We only train on to those of you who may know the TCGA cohort where we build these predictors. Okay? We never train on these. And you can see the odds ratios that we get directly from the slides. So after a hundred years of these HNE slides being the workhorse of pathology, we are reviving them in the context of AI and machine learning and showing that we can predict molecular data from that and from that we can predict patient response. Okay, so we turn then to ask, okay, this is, this is interesting, we like that, but what pathologists do, as you know, for a hundred years, is look at the slides and classify the two more slides into their uh, types and subtypes, right? And this classification is hugely important, needs to be done correctly, okay? Because that affects the prognosis, the, the clinical treatments, everything that the oncologist does uh, in discussions with the patients from, from that diagnostics further. As some of you may know, brain tumor classification into in different subtypes is considered perhaps the most challenging classification in pathology, in modern pathology. And in recent years, it is based on machine learning of methylation arrays. So you measure methylation arrays for patients' brain tumor. And there are machine learning developed both in the US and Europe. And this is considered the gold standard, okay? This is the gold standard in, in, in modern big medical centers in the world, okay? So we, uh, in collaboration with my close friend, Ken Aldape, and collaborator who is chief of pathology of NCI, we collected thousands of tumor slides with methylation sequencing, uh, uh, um, anything that we could collect and aim to build and test on an independent data set the first accurate classifier of brain tumors directly from the slides. 
Okay, so that's what we did, and, and very briefly, there is some architecture, again, deep learning, you can ask me, we build, we predict directly from the slides, but we also, which is most powerful, infer the methylation from the slides, and based on that, we predict the tumor subtypes at a resolution of 10 main tumor subtypes in brain tumors, and actually, it turns out that we can predict methylation to an even much larger, larger accuracy than we can predict gene expression. And to those of you who, who, who may know, it makes good sense because methylation is now considered as the stable hallmark of different cell types and, and tissues. So that was, was really very reassuring. And I, I love discussion and questions, so I don't want to go much overboard, but I can come back to these slides. I want to tell you that over a collection of, I don't know, 3,000, 4,000 patient samples, we, we only train on one set and t test on three different large data sets independently. We, uh, we, we rank all these 10 categories, and then we have the top one, that means the one that we say is the best, and the top two, the top two best. So over all cohorts, all slides, we have top two accuracy 95% and top one accuracy 85%, but we have built some confidence estimator. So if we look only on the two thirds of the slides, which we know our predictor thinks he knows the diagnosis with high confidence, we get this crazy accuracy of 98% top two accuracy and 95% top one accuracy. But this slide is, is really uh, important. So this slide tells the story of, of this study, which is, is to appear soon in Nature Medicine. And we did a head-to-head -head comparison between the machine and the diagnosis of brain pathologists, neuropathologists, experts in the field. So we have the diagnosis of the brain pathologist, we have the diagnosis of the machine, and we have the ground truth, which is the result of the measured methylation arrays, which we, of course, never looked at. Okay, we are doing everything just from the slides and inferring the methylation. And in 23% of the cases, our algorithm correctly corrected the erroneous diagnosis made by pathologists, and only in 4% of the cases, compared to the gold standard, the pathologist classifications were correct and the algorithms one were incorrect, according to the gold standard, okay? So it's five to one to the machine versus neuropathological experts. And, and by the way, the percent of errors made by expert neuropathologists, you may agree with me, it's, it's a bit uh, concerning and, and thought-provoking. And, and quite a few of these are clinically meaningful, guys. Okay? So, let me tell you something. Why am I excited so much about the slides? Because, just imagine, if we can really do it, okay, and I believe we can already, and I believe we will get better soon, very soon, and others who will join this effort, we will be a, able to make this available in the developing world. I mean, it really takes out the, the considerable costs and efforts and infrastructure of sequencing out of the game. And if generalized, can make tumor classification, can make a huge impact on tumor classification and, and molecular inference and, to me, the closest to my heart, stratifying patients to therapy. This is no nonsense. And even in the developing world, 
even in modern big medical centers in the US, it takes about a month, six weeks, to get the results of the sequencing and, and the, the treatment recommendations and the tumor classification and what have you until it comes back to the clinician in the patient. While the time cycle of this is two, three days. So it's, it's revolutionary. Let me tell you something. We have these papers coming up based on the results that I've shown you in nature medicine, in nature cancer, in the coming few weeks. But in a way, this is old, old news, old history. By now, we have much better predictors and results, much better than what I've shown you and what will appear in these publications as the news, okay? So, as I say here, together we stand, and yes, we can. And lastly, I mean, I want to pay a special tribute to these two amazing young scientists, and which also demonstrate to you, you know, the, the, the multi-ethnicity of, 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 of our fellows. One of them is, is uh, Dan Tai Huang, who is an amazing person. I don't have the time to tell you about his personal story, which is heroic, okay? From a small village in Vietnam and, and what have you. And the other one is Eldad Schulman, another fellow, and both are brilliant, and it's really their work, and I am indebted to them. So thank you so much, and I'll be very happy to take questions. Any questions are good, and thank you. <laughs>